uh, welcome all uh, to this one week virtual faculty development program on artificial intelligence for electrical engineering uh, today is the second day of this uh, faculty development program uh, also we are fortunate to have the whole team of uh, scoltech university uh, shortly they will present uh, their session uh, so i welcome to this team also and all the participants uh, as uh, it is a uh, very coincidence that today is the ieee day so i wish all you a happy ieee day to all these uh, uh, members uh, if you see the ieee uh, is the one of the uh, biggest technical organization uh, it is uh, focusing and dedicating uh, you can see the uh, it is one of the world's largest organization and dedicating to the advancing innovation and technological excellence uh, for the benefit of humanity uh, it is the it is designed to serve professionals involved in all aspects of the electrical electronic and computing fields and related areas of science and technology that underline modern civilization so i wish you all once again happy ieee day and happy learning uh, and happy uh, this uh, technical life and uh, i wish all you uh, best uh, and this ieee day is most celebrated uh, from 25 september to 17 october means uh, throughout this uh, uh, span uh, people are celebrating so i am fortunate to we are also having a, a very imminent session uh, by this uh, scoltech team and yes uh, we are happy to have uh, you all team uh so i hand over to uh, dr sujit for further yeah thank you uh, first of all uh, i would like to thank the professor uh, valdemir uh, prezia for uh, and his team for accepting our invitation and i would like to welcome uh, professor valdemir uh, he is a full professor at scoltech and fellow ieee and he is also an uh, editor in chief in ijeps elsewhere journal i would also like to introduce and welcome elena she is uh, uh, assistant professor with energy science and technology scoltech and she will be uh, moderating this uh, session and this uh, and uh, raju ilia and mile they will be discussing uh, various aspects of uh, artificial intelligence uh, in applications in electrical power system so welcome all uh, scoltech team and uh, i'm not wasting much more time i would like to hand over this virtual dais to elena for carry forwarding the session elena. welcome all Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for a warm introduction. Uh, so, so I'm very happy on behalf of uh, Professor Vladimir Terzia to moderate the session, uh, which is devoted to a very fascinating topic uh, of artificial intelligence in electrical engineering. Um, we represent Scoltech. Scoltech is a recently established university very close to moscow russia uh, and uh, happily in uh, 2019 uh, scoltech uh, was like marked as a nature index uh, yandex university uh, yeah yeah so oh, no, ma'am please continue huh? yeah yeah so it was like uh, mentioned among young universities uh in nature index which means that the publication activity at scoltech really um is very scoltech is active and uh, we do publish in um, like nature index um journals well maybe it's not exactly the story about energy and power systems guys because our uh journals these are i i triple e transactions journals uh which are not nature index however uh like to, to have you an overview that what scoltech is like i think it's really worth mentioning and um uh, from starting from 
uh, this year we are happy to have uh, Vladimir Terzi with us and uh, he also runs a very impressive project about advanced monitoring, protection and control of future power systems. So um, that's also a great opportunity to establish a really like a high level RTDS lab uh, and to run all the necessary experiments we need. Uh, so, artificial intelligence, you know, in Russia, like mathematical school is, is relatively strong and uh, natur well, naturally our interest to artificial intelligence, well, it's quite clear. Uh, well, speaking about myself, my background is not in power system, but like in uh, control and optimization in a wider perspective. So that's why, like, I really have strong interest in artificial intelligence and in power systems. Um, and uh, today we'll be happy to share with you some, well, first of all, like general introduction and fundamentals of uh, artificial intelligence and some specific topics more focused on uh, artificial intelligence applications in power systems. So we'll talk about advances in non-intrusive load monitoring. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, machine learning uh, for power system optimization. And uh, the, the third topic of today um, will be about system inertia monitoring using uh, artificial neural networks. So I suggest let's start. Uh, let me give the floor to the first speaker. So this is Ilya Kamushov, a PhD student from Skoltech. And uh, he will start with first like fundamentals of artificial intelligence, just to, to be sure that we speak the same language uh, to somehow narrow our, well, to cover sort of educational part of, of this uh, session. So yeah, Ilya, uh, I see your screen already, oh. so. Hello yeah. everyone, hello colleagues. Thank you for invitation for this talk. So I hope you hear me and you at least see the screen, right? Yes, yeah. OK, it is thank, you. thank you. So le let me start the talk about the fundamentals of AI. So today I will tell you about what is AI actually is, which problems it solves every day in our everyday life, and I will briefly explain the machine learning problems and algorithms, and also we'll uh, have a look on deep learning models and their capabilities from both applications and from both uh, their mathematical point of view. So, and as a conclusion, I will ex say something about the current challenges in modern AI, especially in engineering tests. So let's start. Oh, artificial intelligence is actually the intelligence which is demonstrated by the machines. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, as a science has appeared based on cons assumption that human mind or animal's mind can be so precisely described as machines can simply simulate it. But artificial intelligence is not only about the algorithms, it's more about philosophy and about the ethics and so on, and in any other related fields. So, but the machine learning is a part of artificial intelligence, which, uh, which studies uh, the algorithms, which can be automatically improved by their own experience and the data without explicit programming. And deep learning uh, is a part of machine learning in its turn, which studies the family of algorithms which are based purely on neural networks. So you, you may know that many people today think that neural networks is just artificial intelligence. Yes, it's a part of artificial intelligence, but it's not uh, artificial intelligence as it is. So, but why the industries need artificial intelligence? So at first, because of reduction of errors that human usually do. At second, it's a faster decisions because machines have much more powerful resources to compute and to take decisions. And uh, a very important thing that machines are, uh, can be available uh, all the time, 24 hours a week, because they are made to do this. 
So while people need some rest, need some relax and so on. And the very interesting thing from machines uh, is that they don't have any emotions. So they operate strictly by relying on the logic. And uh, in, in this turn, it uh, produced some uh, a very interesting problem, which I will probably uh, uh, talk at the end of the presentation is like fairness of algorithms. Why is the machine learning algorithms must be fair? Well, let's uh, have a look on uh, uh, daily problems that artificial intelligence is solve, solving every day. So the very famous problem is computer vision. The computer vision is about extracting some insights from the pictures, from photos or images. And uh, the, the famous one, probably everybody of you knows, uh, as a part of autonomous cars is real-time object detection. Here, for example, you have some image frame and you have uh, some objects and the goal for AI is to spot as much, much more uh, objects possible out of this photo. For example, this eye can distinguish cars from persons and from traffic lights and some signs on the street. Another interesting problem is photo modifications without uh, requirement to have some software to uh, process the photo, some skills and so on. We can just uh, learn the uh, distribution of, dis of uh, for example, of, uh, hair colors and uh, glasses for some photos. And we can just tune some parameters which are responsible for color of the hairs or for, oh, sorry, or for some uh, glasses, color of glasses. So here you can see is example of variation autoencoder, which have just two parameters and we can vary them and we can just edit the only single photo here without the requirement of uh, some strong skills in photo editing. So uh, it's also related to some such uh, very, common pro very common models which are known as deep fakes. And uh, another uh, problem uh, which is solving every day, probably most of you are uh, even use it. For example, audio recognition. Uh, if, for example, if you use your voice assistance or you use some software applications on mobile, to recognize some music uh, on the street. Yeah, this is related to the audio recognition touch. So how it works? Actually, we have some sound waveform. We have to have its digital, uh, anal digital copy and we can extract spectrogram out of it and then pass to the neural network, for example, or to another machine learning algorithm, uh, which will make some transformations which are pretty unclear for people, for human, but is very clear for machine. And then it outputs some uh, objects or some classes of sounds which were recognized over this uh, sound wave. And another very interesting uh, problem is web search. For example, currently some very known uh, search engines use uh, uh, such a technique which is known as Latin semantic analysis, which allows you to extract the context of your search query and based on such a context or a meaning, uh, output your more similar web pages to your context. So for example, the, this uh, engine has already processed a lot of web pages and it's no its context and it's looking for a most similar context to your search query another thing is recommended systems for example you may notice that you can scroll or surf over the web shops and at some point you can find that um, uh, it's some website recommend your books which you, <laughs> you did not even found before but this uh, system already suggested you that you need such a book. So it's, it's amazing and that some, someday it can really surprise. But um, we can talk about the applications too, uh, too much, much more time, but it's also important to understand why machines learn. So here uh, I can give you a formal definition of learning from machine learning. So suppose you have some training data set or just a data set. Data set is a collection of 
data points for in our case it's collection of examples it's a pair of some feature uh, and the and the another value is for example the desired response for example x can be a pixels or your photo and y is the what is the object on your photo so it's our data set and we can have uh infi infinite number of such an examples for example we can have millions of photos and corresponding millions objects which which are on the photos and uh, the best way to understand it to look at this diagram for example we have some machine learning algorithm not necessarily neural network but any other machine learning algorithm and it uh, at the beginning it should be initialized randomly for example so a machine learning algorithm usually have hyperparameters and uh, nobody knows which parameters should we take at the beginning it's just a uh, random guess and later on over during the learning these parameters can be adjusted in order to solve your problem so and machine learning algorithm is usually can be described as a function just mathematical function f and at uh, for some set of hyperparameters you will have some different uh, functions f out of family f f capital and here uh, for example you put the photo pictures of a photo to your model and it outputs you for example that it detects here a dog where actually there was a cat so then we have to compute the error the error can be computed based on your policy it depends on your task then uh, the general for, uh, formulation for this learning algorithm is can be can, uh, written as follows for example we can have some lambda which is la our learning algorithm it is just abstract uh, notation for any learning algorithm Mo uh, learning algorithm can be uh, considered uh, uh, let's say for for different tasks you can find your own learning algorithm so but generally uh, you can have for example infinite number of training examples and for this learning algorithm outputs your uh, your algorithms your function with different uh, hyperparameters and among these all of these possible functions you can have the optimal one which will for example, solve your problem with uh, ac very accurate, so meaning with very high accuracy score. So here you can find, for example, some lower bound for this error, and the goal of the lambda of the learning algorithm is to minimize the error that you can compute with up to some small epsilon in order to reach the optimal uh, error. So the goal of learning algorithm is to minimize the error and propagate this error back in the le machine learning algorithm to adjust the hyperparameters that can be um, appropriate for your problem. And in machine learning, there are uh, basically two types of very, is, is, there are many more types of learning tasks, but uh, very very famous uh, are supervised learning and unsupervised learning the supervised learning meaning that we in, in order uh, in order to solve the problem we have to have training examples which consist from features and from the desired responses meaning we can compute the error here uh, by comparing the actual output of the model and the desired response for example one of these tasks is classification for example we can have two set of points, for example, blue one and red one, and we, the goal of machine learning algorithm is to classify them one from another. If this, uh, if we can separate them by a linear hyperplane, that means the data is linearly separable and it's very easy and very fast to solve. But usually in real life, there is no such opportunity to have a linearly separable data. It's usually nonlinear, as you can see here, for example, uh it's there are two spirals one branch of spiral is uh, green dots and another one is red dots it's meaning that there are two classes and the neural network have to decide which uh, dots are red red uh, and which are green for example here you can see the green region and the red region they are known as decision regions 
of some machine learning algorithms, meaning that if you put anything in this region, which is right now, it will be classified as a class B, for example, class of red dots. And the same for green region. Another supervised learning is a regression problem, uh, where, for example, you, uh, you can have some discrete set of data and you, uh, you, you, you want, for example, interpolate this data or extrapolate this data. And the task of interpolation or extrapolation in terms of machine learning is known as a regression problem. For example, if you want to, if you have some history of uh, electricity prices over the last 20 years, you can use them to predict the further prices. And let's talk about the unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is about learning without the desired responses, meaning we just have only the data points and that's it. And what insights can we extract out of here? So for example, we can have some data points which align in 2D plane. For example, uh, let's say, for example, some, let's consider them as a different country, so that is a different cities, the positions of, of the cities on, on your map. So, and the goal of the cluster algor clustering algorithm is to uh, automatically decide which cities belongs to one country and which cities belongs to another country. In, in this case, the solution is very simple. Uh, you can, for example, uh, imp implement a metric based on Euclidean metrics, for example, measure the distances, the closest distances between the nearest points. And minimizing these uh, distances, you can decide which clusters are appropriate for this task. But in real life, usually it happens something like this. For example, we can have a lot of overlapping points and the very uh, complex task is to find appropriate metric or appropriate algorithm which will separate them properly. And very, very important problem in modern machine learning is dimensionality reduction. Here, uh, the goal is to reduce the uh, dimensionality of a data in order to preserve the inform useful information out of it. For example, you can have millions of images of very high quality, for example, 4K. Uh, and the goal is to reduce, uh, for example, all of the images to have uh, 100 by 100 pixels, but still they can, can uh, should have uh, almost all the information out of this photo. And these techniques are usually applied not just for further um, analysis by humans, but for processing by the machine learning algorithms because machine learning algorithms are computationally expensive and in order to process the data very fast very quick we have to uh, re we can reduce the dimensionality of the uh, input data so in mathematical notation is the dimensionality reduction algorithm is such algorithm which takes your original data and produces almost the same data but with the less dimensionality for example, one of the famous techniques is principal component analysis, where you can apply, for example, single value, value decomposition technique and just extract, for example, eight principal components out of this uh, decomposition. And then you can reconstruct your original data into new lower dimensional space. Ah, and uh, these techniques are very interesting also uh, just to see how your data is actually looks like in some lower dimensional representation. For example, you can apply locally linear embedding to see the, uh, see the projection of high dimensional data on 2D plane. It's very important to see somehow how your data looks like and which models you can apply here. For example, if you we can notice here that these there are two clusters of data, probably we can even simply classify them. And as for deep learning, there are many types of neural networks, but the very uh, well known are f fully connected networks. So this uh, network, um, uh, or even can be considered a mathematical as a graph, which have a layers and neurons inside each layer. Uh, and each neuron in each layer uh, uh, have a connections. For example, this neuron have all the connections with another neurons from another layer, and uh, 
for the second neuron it's the same and the same so it's uh each layer here is usually called a fully connected layer and mathematically what it does it does a fine transformation of your of the data from previous layer to another layer uh you can see I will talk about the affine transformation a bit later, but the main property of fully connected networks uh, is that they have a lot of mathematics behind it. And uh, the mathematical properties are well studied, and that's why people use still the, uh, them in a real task. For example, there are very uh, important properties that such a networks with some parameters uh, can approximate absolutely any function which is continuous and that is really amazing and i will talk about the theorem a bit later another uh, uh part of networks which doesn't have really mathematics behind it I meaning we can express the formulas for this how to compute them and so on but we can't study the properties of these networks because they are very complex uh in terms of ma mathematical notations and there are still no such uh, sim similar theorems for convolutional networks but uh, there are, has to be proven that they are really work nice with the images. For example, the autonomous cars are still using these convolutional networks, and this is how they simply work. For example, we have some photo of a car where we have also sliding window, and sliding window just waiting the pixels on the original photo and projects them into the, another representation of subspace, which is usually known as feature map. And they are do the same way for another layers and other uh, representations and uh, until they have a lower dimensional representation of your higher dimensional representation, representation of uh, image. And then the, this data can be passed through the fully connected layer to take a decision which objects are spotted on this picture. And in order to analyze the time series, we can have recurrent neural networks so what they have, uh, they have some cells uh, which distributed in time. For example, you can put the, for example, sinusoidal wave into as an input to this network, and each timestamp will will be processed one after another, and that's why they called recurrent. And then you can decide uh, something about this uh, time series. And there are actually many revolutionary architectures of neural networks, but why people use different architectures? Because it's for uh, many times it's not so clear which architecture is appropriate. So for example, in computer vision tasks, we can't always uh, use just simple few layers of convolution now neural networks. We have to uh, do some engineering, do some interesting stuff to uh, solve particular problems. For example, if you can, uh, if you want to classify the image, either uh, it's a dog or cat, we can just use a simple convolutional neural network, and that's it. An output will be like classes of uh, objects here. But if you want to solve the object detection task, we ca we have to do some something new. We have to somehow extract the boundaries of, of objects from image and then project these boundaries to the lower dimensional representation of this entire photo and then extract the features uh, to classify which objects in, uh, in each boundary here. For example, here is the, the first end-to-end uh, -end model for object detection was faster RCNN which proposed two uh, networks which were working in parallel. For example, the first one is extracting the uh, features, extracting the lower dimensional representation of your original data, and the region proposal network predicts you uh, bounding boxes for each object being spotted on this photo. And then these uh, boundaries uh, we are projected to the lower dimensional representation of uh, image, and later on it was uh, it was taken uh, the decision were made which class correspond to each object here. And as for m probably some of you heard about the transformer arch architecture, which outperform 
uh, the recurrent neural networks by simply adding the multi heads of attention. So this architecture is entirely based on fully connected layers, but it has some nonlinear uh, operation, which is multi head attention, which resolving the time dependence in, or sequential nat nature of your data. And this uh, architecture was state of the art in 2017, as far as I remember, in, uh, trans in text translations. So, and let's speak about math behind the fully connected layers, but why people use them and why they're so good. So it was proven 30 years ago and even earlier that uh, if we have even one hidden layer network, meaning we just have only one uh, layer of neurons, which are hidden, which is called hidden, and we have only one output layer. Output layer is just, uh, for example, usually it's uh, either binary neuron, which uh, uh, outputs zero or one, for example, for binary classification problem, or just a collection of neurons, or where each neuron is also a binary, for example, one neuron is responsible for the spotting, the, spotting the dog, or another for cats, another for cats, as for, and so on. So usually in output layer, the number of neurons depends on number of classes that your data have. An input number of neurons is usually a number of features that you have. And hidden layer uh, comprises the neurons that are essential to do the proper transformation of input uh, uh, features to get some output features or output classes. And it was proven that uh, even one single hidden layer network is able uh, to approximate any continuous function if uh, activation function is not, not a polynomial. So hidden layer is, as I said before, uh, does a, a fine transformation, which is learnable and following by the activation function. For example, sigma is activation function, which takes it as an argument as a result of a fine transformation. So result of a fine transformation is a vector, for example, and uh, apply, and sigma applies uh, element-wise to this vector. And uh, the, if uh, our sigma activation function is ReLU, which is rectified linear unit, so for example, it disables the neurons which produces the negative output and and enables the neurons which produces positive output. So for this uh, kind of networks, uh, has the new CRM four or three years ago has been proven that the ReLU network of arbitrary de depth uh, and with given uh, uh, width of the each layer as Q can approximate any function if and only if the number of neurons in hidden layer is more than uh, number of input layers. So number of hidden neurons must be at least uh, more uh, the number of features you have. And as for conclusion for for this talk, I would say that. Uh, artificial intelligence, especially machine learning algorithms, have a lot of difficulties. And the main difficulty is that they can be trained very uh, good on the training data, but they usually predict something very poorly. Uh, for, for some tasks, it's not true. For example, in if we can, for example, in uh, o o document detection or some uh, spe uh, text detection that accuracy can be very high because training data was was enough to 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 even predict the previously unseen data. But in most uh, challenges, especially engineering challenges and especially in power system challenges, we cannot extract so much data. For example, as people can make a photos of some dogs and cats. Uh, we have to gather data much longer. Uh, it usually sometimes and can take up to 10 years and it will be sti still not enough uh, to uh, accurately predict the something which ha hasn't been seen before. And 
to train the neural networks of some mach other machine learning algorithms is usually very high, highly computationally expensive in terms of price for equipment, for example, graphical processing units, and in terms of uh, computation number of floating point operations that uh, the, this machine should do. And as I said, the lack of data is very crucial. So, and it's also important to know that the data should be properly processed before the passing through the models, because there is a very interesting golden rule, which is known as garbage in, garbage out, is your data is not representing some redistribution, which can uh, be spotted, for example, in nature, that probably you will not learn anything. But if your uh, data represents the distribution very well, so you have a lot of chances to predict your, to, to apply your model on previously unseen data, to predict the unseen data very accurate. So that is from my side. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you very much for a very informative introduction and uh, which is much more important, uh, bridging and uh, making links with the mathematical essence and some real life application that is definitely of interest for everyone. Um, I think we will skip questions to this part and uh, we'll give Ilya a sort of short break. Uh, and now it's time to move towards like power systems application. And uh, we have a um, pre-recorded um, introductory words uh, from Vladimir Terzia. And if Dr. Sujil uh, can run these records, I will really appreciate it. Yes, surely I'm doing that. Good afternoon and greetings to everybody. My name is Vladimir Terzia. I am full professor at Skoltek, Skolko Institute of Science and Technology. And I'm also head of the laboratory of uh, energy, modern energy systems. I would like to express my thanks to the organizer of this event. And uh, let me share my presentation with you. So I hope that you can see my presentation. I'd like to provide my contribution to this uh, one week virtual faculty development program on artificial intelligence for electrical engineering. And uh, greetings also to my respected colleagues from IEEE Bombay section. The title is protection and control systems of wide area schemes, but more specifically, artificial intelligence for everything that what is in this title. And uh, firstly, this lecture is about electrical power systems. Traditionally, we have generation, we have hydropower, we have coal power, we have nuclear power, and we have transmission. However, trying to achieve targets of clean energy, we are intensively utilizing wind power, solar, but also uh, uh, electrical storage or different types of storage systems which are particularly important from the perspective of intermittency of uh, renewable energy sources, for example, wind. Transmission energy, transmission systems, traditional AC systems, but we are also moving towards DC transmission. This is a typical example of DC transmission, probably more than 500 kilovolt DC voltage. And we traditionally have interconnected electrical power system, we have mixed AC-DC system, and this is a typical classical example in which we have generation, which is then converted to transmission. Uh, we move, for example, from 25 kV or 15 kV to 400 kV. We have step-up transformer, we transport, transmit energy, to different uh, customers. It can be residential areas, it can be also different factories uh, or attraction uh, electrical trains. However, you can see that we have incredible increase of consumption of uh, electricity. This is an example from China. 
trend between 2005 and 2040. So we are talking about critical infrastructure, which must be pro properly monitored, controlled and protected. Because these kind of events can happen. We must have approaches to make our system still secure if we lose one element in the system or even two or even more elements in the system. For this purpose, we have control room. These are traditionally energy management systems or distribution management systems responsible for operation, operation, real-time operation, and also day ahead planning uh, of the system, a different voltage level. So we have also different sizes. We have huge and massive uh, networks, which I'll address after I introduce the topics which I'm going to address today. Introduction about complex ACDC networks. I will talk about modern sensors and ICT and big data challenge. I will talk about artificial intelligence for situation awareness, artificial intelligence for power system and similar services like frequency control, artificial intelligence for multi-energy systems, and some conclusions. And as you can see, and you will see, I will provide an introduction. I will be talking about electrical power system and some aspects in which we ultimately need artificial intelligence to help us making system more secure, more reliable, more flexible, and more resilient. This is a part of European super grid in which you can see the parts of the system, for example, UK, which is a separate asynchronous zone, this is NERDO and UCT, they are operating in, in a different way. They have its own control mechanisms, but they can be con connected over high voltage DC transmission lines. This is the case, for example, between Russian Federation and UCT. This is back to back connection over converter based uh, substation. Or we have also intertire line between France and Britain, connecting two of them and providing different types of ancillary services and support to systems. They can support each other from different perspective, changing flow of power from Britain to France or from France to Britain, depending on the status of generation and load in each of these systems. However, today, the world grid, which is meshed HVDC, uh, our system network, transmission network, is built. These are a number of challenges brought in this part of the system. For example, DC circuit breaker or protection of this uh, complex meshed system. We are very familiar with protection of and monitoring and control of traditional AC systems, but uh, meshed uh, uh, DC system, that's more complex. However, this entire integration is becoming exceptionally concept. And we are also moving towards a large quantity of data obtained for such a system. And the question is how optimally, how efficiently extract the knowledge from this data. Here, artificial intelligence can help. This is one of the projects in which I was involved. At that time, I was professor at the University of Manchester in Great Britain. And this is a fitness project which was focused on technological advancements on a digital substation, which will enable better quality of data acquisition and data transfer from one to another level. You can see that we are now in a digital substation compared to this traditional substation in which we have wires. Instead of wires, we have fiber optic. We have non-conventional instruments as formulas, using which we even immediately convert AC information to a DC information and transfer over different communication protocols, for example, I for example, IC 61850 communication protocol or IEEE phasers, synchro phasers protocol and transfer from substation to higher level towards energy management system. So the quality of data 
from the perspective of accuracy, less noise, and the speed is becoming higher. And this is now a neighbor of advanced applications for electrical power systems. And all this data should be processing one or another way. It's very often about optimization. In this context, machine learning and artificial intelligence are very important candidates for solving some of problems related to monitoring, protection, and control of modern electrical power systems. This is one paper which is uh, talking about application of uh, phasor measurement units, application of uh, communication infrastructure, data concentrators, and advanced applications for monitoring, protection, and control of uh, large networks. In this paper, we have tried to bring experience both from academia, but also from industry. And in this context, uh, I'm very proud that a uh, few of my former PhD degree students were co-authors of this high impact paper. Let me give more information just about one of uh, uh, sources of data. I'm now talking about why they are monitoring protection control. We are using phasor measurement units, or in general terms, synchronous measurement units, which are synchronous, time synchronized <coughs> through different types of uh, time synchronization, for example, GPS or other sources, GLONASS, Galileo, or Baidu. And uh, this data using wide area network, where we ha might have issues with cybersecurity, can be sent to our data concentrator and then be used for different applications for electrical power system. Here, artificial intelligence and machine learning can help us from different perspectives. And speakers coming after me, they will cover some of interesting topics. I'm just opening the scene, 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 scene for different uh, things which will be discussed later. This is one of examples uh, in which uh, phasor measurement units uh, were used uh, to improve the quality of uh, situational awareness in Great Britain. This is visor project in which uh, next to existing phasor measurement units, additional phasor measurement units were installed and used, for example, for improved state estimation that has led to hybrid state estimator. But next to these elements of synchronous measurement technology, also waveform monitoring units, which uh, are operating differently, they are not sending phasers every 50, actually every 20 milliseconds. They are sending voltage samples every five milliseconds, what means that the sampling rate is not 50 hertz, but 200 hertz. The reason for installation of this kind of new sensors, sensors in general terms, is the dangerous sub resonance, which could happen in Great Britain as a result of recently installed series compensation. That's why this series compensation is seen. There is to control series compensator, compensation which can, in real time, change its operating point and change capacity at the end of the day and uh, bring us to the state in which we will be far away from dangerous subsequent resonance, which, for example, in 90s, I think, destroyed the huge generator, generating units in Texas. So artificial intelligence could be used for uh, extracting knowledge from all this data. One of examples is uh, power system inertia. And uh, later, after my presentation, Raju will address this issue through his presentation in which artificial neural networks were used for this purpose. However, the system could also have problems with voltage stability. And voltage stability is traditionally related to short circuit level in the system. 
So we are actually dealing with the weak networks, networks with high penetration of renewable energy sources, in which inertia is reduced, in which fault level is reduced, in which we have more problems with the power system stability from the perspective of uh, frequency, voltage, or angular stability. And artificial intelligence can be utilized both at the level of monitoring, but also control. I'm now talking about uh, transmission networks. However, we can also go deep towards load, towards even houses, which we can monitor and understand their behavior, conception of different elements, so that Ilya will be talking about it a bit later, after me. This is one of ancillary services, frequency control, but fast frequency control in systems with reduced system inertia. When I talk about inertia, I'm talking about rotational inertia, which is converted into huge kinetic energy. If we have huge kinetic energy, if we have changes at demand side, or significant changes on generation side, for example, sudden disconnection of an important generator, the system will still, the system with huge kinetic energy will still retain frequency which is near 50 hertz. Otherwise, if it is not the case, the system might go into frequency collapse or total entire system separation or even dangerous blackout. In this context, by utilizing phasor measurement units, we collect data, process data, and then generate commands to fast service providers. Fast service providers where service is uh, injection of active power. In this context, wind farms, demand side, PV energy storage, or combined cycle gas turbines can quickly do that, can quickly inject extra active power. However, for example, in the case of uh, wind farms, this can be done only for limited time. For example, 10, 15 seconds, it depends on the construction of wind farm, or energy storage can provide this extra energy dependent on available energy. At one moment, energy storage will be empty. But the important thing is that we increase the speed of injecting active power, generating active power to the system, what classical generators cannot do. They can provide more, but very slowly, and that's the problem. Artificial intelligence would be needed here to, de to detect patterns uh, which could lead to different types of frequency instabilities, but also for estimation of power system inertia. And let me move to another view in which we integrate different energy systems or energy vectors like electricity network, gas network, heat network, or even if we combine with everything that hydrogen. This whole system would offer us a huge quantity of data which could be used for processing and understanding more clearly what is happening with this entire grid. And for example, we could encourage some of, some of these systems to support another systems to enable flexibility of operation. And in this context, the artificial intelligence-based approaches are very good candidates to be used in future. So in conclusions, I would say that the dynamic properties of future power systems are different than those in the past, particularly as a result of high penetration of converter interface generation, and also considering that the network is not predominantly AC network, but also a combination of AC and DC network. We have more complex topology and hybrid AC-DC network, as mentioned, and we have a consequence, for example, impact to the system inertia, fault level, or even harmonics level. Future power systems require new methods and approaches for protection and control. 
and new technology, including normal sensors, for example, phaser measurement units, and communication infrastructure, ICT, are enablers of new solutions. And artificial intelligence and machine learning based approaches are becoming more and more dominant also in practical applications. So let me express my thanks for attending my lecture and for, for attending my part. I am convinced that the rest presented today will be equally interesting or even more interesting, particularly from the perspective of more specific details related to artificial intelligence and uh, uh, machine learning approaches. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Goodbye. Okay, great. So, um, thanks to Vladimir's presentation, you now have an overview of a variety of um, applications, power system applications that can be addressed or is about uh, that appeal to provide artificial intelligence tools to to handle it to, to solve this problem so now we pre uh, now we have uh, three more talks scheduled and they will cover different aspects different applications uh, in, in in energy systems that can be tailored with the artificial intelligence technique I, I, either it will be deep learning or some machine learning tools uh, uh, different tools are, are available for this. So uh, we will start uh, presentations now. I would like to ask presenters to to tell your story within 20 minutes and probably even save a couple of minutes for questions. So we didn't have opportunity to ask questions before. I believe that uh, within this talk, we will give floor to questions as well. So, the first talk uh, will be from Ilya Kalashev, so I would like to welcome Ilya back and uh, to share us his story about advances in non-intrusive load monitoring. <clears throat> Hello again. Can you see, yeah? Yeah, it's here. Okay, so non-intrusive load monitoring is probably one of the famous and obvious examples of application of uh, artificial intelligence in power systems so this research is more about or uh, sorry this uh, application of this technology is more about uh, distributional grids and utility companies rather than generation level and transmission level P pardon me yeah i'm back so what actually non-intrusive load monitoring is? It's a technology which, were which was proposed uh, about 30 years ago by Hart. And this is about uh, detecting. Uh, so we, we have, it's better to show it uh, in, on the diagram. So suppose we have some household and we have electric grid inside and suppose this house have ju has just three appliances and two of them are consuming some power uh, meaning the uh, there are two power flows which are gathering in this node and then flow uh, these flows going through this line to the uh, voltage source back so uh, if we can install the meter here on this branch, we can gather this aggregated power and send it to the cloud where a neural network, for example, can process this data and output the following information for the end user, for the house owner. For example, uh, it can predict which appliance is now active and which are not and how much power each appliance consume. This is very important as uh, that uh, why so so why people love this technology because it's uh, very cheap to understand what the what is the electric behavior of appliances in your home without violating the privacy of a house uh, owners and there are a lot of applications and very promising is uh, to build a energy data sharing platform. 
for example, it's a cloud service which collects the disaggregated data over over the entire city or small districts and so on. And then it summarizes this data and can sell these statistics to some utility companies or to research institutions or to government. And but why actually the utilities companies, for example, need that, such uh, statistics at, at first because they can forecast a uh, load more accurate. They can pr uh, provide more uh, accurate uh, and more efficient power quality control. And they also now can uh, more precisely plan uh, their grid development. And another interesting application is more for, not for uh, utilities, but more, more for end users. And in, in, if our end user, for example, some small industries or some small businesses, we can analyze the waveforms of a current in order to predict some abnormal regimes of motors. For example, if your refrigerator has, uh, has some compressor which is broken or about to broke, uh, we can uh, observe some interesting patterns there and then we can say, okay, your uh, compressor is, uh, is about to bro be broken, so you should uh, call, call a master to repair it before, before some very dangerous fault. And uh, as for office owners or some medium businesses, they are all, always uh, concerned about the excessive cost on electricity. Therefore, uh, the statistics which can be extracted by the new can be used for uh, development of uh, energy saving strategies or providing some recommendations on the replacement of some particular equipment to, on the uh, energy efficient. And all of these things can be done with use of minimal number of sensors and ideally with use only uh, only one sensor. So, for example, if your office is supplied by the single voltage source, you have at most one sensor. And uh, we can also combine all these things together to get the smart city ecosystem. So this will. Uh, so here, each end user, office owner or household owner, can have uh, all the benefits described before. So it can monitor his loads. It can uh, uh, now know his transparent bills on electricity. It and it can knows uh, when his appliances uh, uh, can be broken soon and so on. And there are for data buyers there are appearing some new case. For example, resellers uh, don't know actually which appliances does some user has now, but if uh, we can sell him a statistics, anonymous statistics, that for example, such particular end user don't have some uninterruptible power supply, uh, but he has very expensive and uh, very powerful computer. So therefore the reseller can uh, advertise uh, this, his products to that end user. Uh, okay, that's it from publications. Let's move to the math and to, to the understanding of a new, what actually new is from a mathematical perspective. Well, the very simple example is to consider the some aggregated waveform of uh, energy consumption, especially in this case, it's a current waveform. So uh, the idea here is to apply new algorithm to this waveform in order to extract all the waveforms from which this signal consists of. For example, if there are only three appliances working and there are mixer, kettle and microwave, the goal is to get such uh, waves. But it's an uh, ideal case when we can do that. Uh, but it's both uh, regression and classification problems as I pointed before in previous presentation. But in fact, uh, this task has not been solved yet. So what is solved is we can say, for example, which appliances are working simultaneously now. And for example, we can also say how much uh, energy does they consume based on statistics. But we cannot just 
purely or very accurately reconstruct the waveforms which correspond to some particular appliances at this type uh, of consumption. For example, if mixer can have many regimes, many speeds, and uh, we cannot even uh, distinguish, it will, it, will be very, it will be very complicated to say that mixer now is working on, at such regime and so on. So it's about the future work in this area. And there, there is a new framework which is established and it consists from three main parts. So the first one is event detection. So the goal from the sensor part is to, uh, is to extract the useful signal. And then we have to extract the features out of this signal. For example, we can apply Fourier transform and then we can pass this feature uh, to the learning algorithm, for example, neural network. And then uh, this neural network can be used in reality, in, in, in real business applications to predict the classes or to predict the appliances which were spotted over this signal. But which features actually we can also extract? So it depends on the time scale of a signal. So the first uh, category is uh, when we have uh, dozens of points per second, usually it's root mean square values, we can observe here long-term dependencies such as periodicity of a signal and signal shape. And uh, if we will rely on the uh, high sampling waveforms, we can extract harmonics and transient processes out of signal. As for today, the recent papers on load identification with use of deep neural networks outperform previous models based on machine learning, such as random forest or gradient boosting and so on. But there all have still some uh, limitations. The first one is that standard data collection process is very time expensive. And uh, in order to collect the data, for example, for thousands of appliances, we have to wait for years. And another problem is that nobody uh, ever focused before on how much a simultaneously working appliances, their algorithms can distinguish each from another. And it was, we, uh, my, we extracted our own statistics uh, for over the previous researchers, and we found out that there are models which we are working with no more than four appliances working simultaneously. And usually people, researchers, do not share their source code. So meaning that even the models which they propose, we can't even validate because they didn't even share their models. And our hypothesis was, does the synthetic data or high sampling rate signals allow to train deep neural network to identify up to appliances uh, with up to 10 of them working simultaneously? And the objectives were in our research to develop methodology or even algorithm to construct the well-balanced new data set, which will comprise various combinations of individual loads out of small amount measurements available. So we will need just to measure the single devices separately, and then we can simulate the uh, aggregated uh, work. But another uh, objective was to build a first large scale new model, which, we, which will be able to identify up to different loads working simultaneously. And uh, we, we have compared our uh, model obtained with previous approaches via classification metric and published the source code to the GitHub repository so everyone can reproduce the results. Uh, so what about the simulation data, data set? We, have, we first uh, downloaded two data open access data sets which comprising uh, various signatures of uh, consumption patterns of some categories of appliances. There were 54 appliances, types of appliances in these data sets. Then we uh, applied the algorithm which we called SNS, Synthesizer of Normalized Signatures Algorithm. You can read about it in our paper. And we, uh, uh, that's why we obtained such uh, simultaneous work of these appliances in various combinations of them. And uh, for training purposes, we simulated 100,000 aggregated signals, which comprise in one, two, four, six, eight, and 10 concurrent loads. We dropped here three, five, seven, and nine uh, P 
because we the goal was to train the network to train the network in order to disaggregate the data not to memorize the combinations of appliances and test and the test set comprised uh, 50 thousand aggregated signals with one up to 10 concurrent walls, concurrent walls. And the model is actually looks like this. So it takes a spectrogram as an input with such a dimensionality. And the output is a vector of scores for each appliance being detected over this spectrogram. Here we use position wise layers is simply fully connected layers, but which takes uh, not only the vectors, but also the matrices. So we also use the residual connections. You can read about the residual connections in the authors of this uh, mechanism. So basically we used uh, only the fully connected layers uh, with some small uh, changes in order to avoid the overfitting and so on. And we, at the end of the model, we put the multi head self attention, which automatically resolves the time dependencies in data. So this mechanism allows to analyze the transient processes here in the signal, while this part of the network allows to learn the harmonics from the spectrogram. And we use the loss uh, function uh, as, which is binary cross entropy in order to restrict all the values from uh, zero to one. Uh, and we also use the sigmoid activation to, uh, for this purpose. So uh, we use the PyTorch uh, framework for building this network. And we train this network with use of two GPUs, which you most of you know. And uh, the results are as follows. Uh, Number, uh, we re reveal the statistics uh, on, uh, on how our model is good at identification of one appliances and two appliances working simultaneously and three appliances working simultaneously and so on. And we can see here that the accuracy is actually uh, dropping, not exponentially, but uh, closely to linear, uh, depend to linear pattern. So we can see here that it, uh, our network is able to identify, identify single appliances with up to 95% of, of uh, F score, which we refer here as to accuracy. Uh, and it's really good at identification even up to five appliances working simultaneously, but it's become very hard and very complex, complicated to identify, identify up to 10 appliances working simultaneously. And here is a statistic over the different uh, kind of appli appliances. And we can see here that uh, just 10 appliances out of 54 were uh, classified uh, poor, poorly, poorer than 70%. So, and here is the reason why. So first, because these appliances had the lowest root mean square value uh, in the uh, data set and most of them are sinusoidal and to detect uh, sinusoidal signals working simultaneously is very complicated and can be resolved only by the transient process or phase shifts and and some examples didn't have some uh, so expressive patterns like in other electronic devices so you can get more insights if you will work with our data by yourself applying some techniques or some statistical methods you know uh, but here uh, I, I, will I'm I will finish on discussion so first we compared our model with previously a state-of-the-art model which also paid attention to the maximum number of concurrent concurrent loads which appeared in the data set but they didn't even try to make a uh, simulation of more appliances working simultaneously they worked with the data they had so that was the goal. And uh, they worked with the data, uh, which we also used in our, in, in our uh, simulation. And so meaning that uh, we have a lot of overlappings in patterns, but they had uh, much less appliances in total. And the three of them were working simultaneously. While in our, in our case, we had 10 appliances working simultaneously out of 54. Yeah, and we had in our case also much more training and testing examples. 
and you can see that the difference is not so high, especially if you extract the statistics for three appliances working simultaneously and average them, we will get about 90%. So meaning that our synthetic data can be approxi can approximate real conditions, real data. So, but we can save a lot of time resources in collection of such a data. Oh, well, probably that's it from my side. I don't want to spend more time on details so, and so on. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you, Ilya, for a very interesting presentation and very uh, live uh, application of artificial intelligence in energy sector. Uh, I think we have an opportunity for a couple of questions. Uh, we have a chat of the event, but so far I don't see any questions there. So if you have any questions, if you would like to ask anything specific to Ilya, please use the chart and do it. And so far, while we wait for, for this, probably the questions will appear. Um, so Ilya, maybe you can comment a little bit about uh, what if we would like to solve this problem with no, not deep learning, but with other, say, statistical methods or something like this. But the point is that statistical methods are now <laughs> considered as machine learning methods. Yeah, okay. Well, okay. I, I mean, not deep learning, not uh, artificial neural not, not deep uh, learning. Not deep not learning, deep but some... Not, yeah. uh, so probably you mean uh, like regression, like line, linear yeah, regression? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, more... Yes, we haven't Let's shown it this the tools, if we would try to apply them. Okay, so first I haven't shown in this presentation how the data is look like in its uh, like representational space. Most uh, at first because, ah yes, look at this problem as a clustering problem. So we can, for example, imagine that we projected all the signatures, individual signatures of appliances on the 2D plane, I mean, in a flat plane, and you can see uh, some small clusters, yes? And uh, if you can see them, then you can use uh, any, for example, absolutely any type of machine learning algorithm within simple statistical methods to distinguish them. It's already done, yes, and it's wor it works. But when we're talking about the com combinatorial work of devices, so here uh, appears the problem and appears the question how to cluster them when they work simultaneously. There are becoming a lot of overlappings and it's a task uh, for more for deep learning because uh, deep learning at least in theory can, uh, can approximate any function while some machine learning methods also can approximate any functions but they have a lot of restrictions to that uh, data and they are very sensitive to the data. So, for example, they can overfit, but they will not, uh, let's say, uh, predict the unknown data. For example, decision tree or random forest can uh, learn, memorize all the data, but it will not spot new appliances, for example, which it hasn't seen before, but new network can do that. Okay, so we, uh, we received a question from the chat. Uh, yeah, I guess you can, to, can you see the chat or not? Uh, if, if you can't, I can read the question for you. Okay. Ah, okay. Read me, please. Yeah, okay. So the question is about the person is working on fault detection in power system and uh, collect the data of different faults at different location. And the data is 800 times 21. It's not quite clear what this 800 times 21 goes from. But the question is, like, is it... Uh, is this data sufficient or uh, or he need to collect more data? Ah, I, I got it. I suppose you have like two, if you have 800 examples with 21 features, that means it depends. Uh, probably you can test your algorithm. You can even work with this data, but it's, uh, let's say, if the data is linearly separable, probably that will be enough number of points. 
but if there are much more much more complex relations meaning you have to collect uh, as much as more data as possible but still you can't or at least overfit on this data so you can uh try any model that you that you like and that is more appropriate for this task and then you can uh, collect much more data just to improve the accuracy okay there is also a comment about like checking efficiency of the tool uh that's like exactly uh, that's exactly what we're trying to do uh yeah and the question okay one more question is how spectrogram is obtained and which optimization algorithms were used ah, in the yes. experiments? So for spectrogram, uh, we used a short time Fourier transform uh, with normalization, and we just extracted the complex values out of it, and then we took the absolute values. So the spectrogram is absolute values of short time Fourier transform. So the window size uh, for Fourier window was, uh, as far as I remember, 480. And the overlapping uh, lens was uh, 80 points. And optimization algorithm was Adam optimizer, adaptive moment optimization algorithm, uh, with learning rate, uh, as far as I remember, three to the times 10 to the power of minus four or minus three. I don't remember uh, actually the number of this algorithm because we also use the uh, uh, annealing strategy for learning rate. So it was reduced during the training. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you for answering all the specific questions. And now I'm looking forward to give a floor to the next presenter. This is Mili Mitrovich, who is uh, also a PhD student at Skoltech, and he will talk about machine learning for power system optimization. So, Mili. here hello yes hello i'm here yeah hello uh, this uh, this see uh, hello hello yeah. uh let me know do you hear me and do you do you see my uh, presentation yeah i hear you well and your presentation is on the screen maybe you should uh, move to full screen mode okay now it's okay yeah it's fine and um, okay uh, okay, thank you, Elena, for introduction, and uh, thank you, organizer, and also Professor Vladimir. Uh, my name is Mila Mitrovic, and I'm a PhD student at Skoltek University in Russia, and today I will talk about uh, machine learning for power system optimization. Uh, this is content, uh, what I plan to talk uh, today. Uh, I will start uh, with uh, definitions of terms, uh, which... Uh, uh, make uh, power system engineers often confused. Exactly, uh, I will uh, briefly talk. Uh, I will briefly talk about differences between artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, deep learning, and data science. Uh, then I will talk uh, about using machine learning for power system optimization. Uh, also, I explain how it can be done for stochastic optimization and. Uh, uh, I will give uh, you some examples of real application of machine learning in power industry, uh, which uh, our team uh, have done. Uh, okay. Um, uh, okay, let's start. Uh, what is artificial intelligence? Uh, artificial intelligence uh, means enable machine to think without uh, any human uh, interaction. And then we have machine learning. Exactly, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And machine learning provides us uh, statistical tool, tools uh, to explore and analyze the data. And in machine learning, we have exactly four different approaches, like supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised, and reinforced. But previously, Ilya, Ilya talked about that uh, more deeply, and uh, this part I will skip. And we will see what is deep learning. Exactly, deep learning, it is a subset of machine learning. And uh, the main idea of deep learning is to mimic human brains using uh, neural network architect architectures. And we have different uh, architectures, like, like full connector neural network, uh, 
convolutional neural network, uh, recurrent GRU or LSTM and intention. And difference of problem which we have to do, we will use uh, different architecture or we can also combine those architecture. And uh, exactly the main idea uh, and or the main goal is to use uh, machine learning uh, and uh, deep learning technique uh, to create artificial intelligence applications, for example, like uh, autonomous cars or smart robot or application in power system and uh, so on. And also we have data science. Uh, what is data science? Data science, it is all about data. Uh, data science, um, uh, dealing with uh, collecting data, analyzing data, processing and pre-processing, visualization and so on. And also, if you see data science applying science applying uh, machine learning and deep learning tools, and also it is used some uh, mathematical tools like statistics, probability linear algebra, uh, to understand the data and to prepare data for artificial intelligence uh, application. And I hope after this and also what Ilya previously talked that uh, you can now make sense uh, what uh, those terms means. Uh, now, uh, let's see how machine learning can be used for power system optimization. Uh, generally, uh, power system optimization, uh, generally optimization is, um, let's say, uh, very popular in power system application. And uh, typical optimization tasks are optimal dispatch, planning, uh, system identification, dynamic security, and uh, electricity market operation. Uh, and uh, until now, all these uh, problems were done with um, conventional, conventional uh, optimization methods. Uh, but um, uh, the major uh, challenge is how to design efficient and uh, reliable methods to increase optimization performance. But again, uh, the problem is that conventional optimization methods uh, have shown limitation in complicated and uh, and uh, violated environments uh, such as future power system uh, which uh, in in which we have a uh, high penetration on renewable renewable energy uh, as we know uh, power system optimization has high requirements for the algorithm reliability uh, because um, a potential fail failure uh, could lead to sig significant uh, financial loss. But, uh, however, machine learning is still having troubles in real world uh, power system applications. For example, we have lack of data. Uh, what it means, it means that uh, real world data uh, are um, uh, rarely public. Uh, I mean that uh, we use uh, simulation data or some synthetic data like alternative. And also, uh, real-world data are um, often in balance. Uh, it means that um, uh, the rare cases uh, in power system, for example, some falls or unstable condition, uh, we can to catch. Uh, and it is sometimes it is very important for for data and for our algorithms. Also, robustness, robustness and prediction errors. Uh, it means how our machine learning algorithm. Uh, will work if we have uh, a large fluctuation in data or some missing data. And also interpretability. Interpretability describes uh, how, uh, how uh, people who work in power system, uh, how they understand the decisions uh, uh, made by uh, machine learning. Exactly for people in, in power system who are not familiar with that, uh, it is like some black box. Uh, but considering a research paper from Bracer Journal in power system, like, uh, for example, IEEE transactions on power system, smart grid, and applied energy, uh, we can see that uh, in last uh, several years, uh, we have an um, exponential uh, increasing of um, research of applying machine learning for power system optimization. And regarding uh, those research where people try to do that, um, there are four categories of the coordination between the machine learning approaches and optimization models. Uh, they are boundary parameter improvement, uh, optimization option, option selection, surrogate model, and hybrid model. And now let's see that, uh, for example, boundary parameter improvement. 
it means that we use machine learning uh, to improve the estimation of border parameters uh, to find uh, more accurate feasible regions and better optimal solutions. Uh, also in power system, there are some factors that uh, may deteriorate exactly the accuracy of boundary parameters like uh, natural variability. For example, we have renewable energy electrical vehicles and uh, they increase uh, uncertainty in power systems. Also some human behaviors, for example, some human mistakes can make randomness of the system or partial of, or observability of the power system. For example, when we make some approximation or some linearization, our model with, will be inaccurate and it will also inf influence of our uh, accuracy of the boundary parameters. And if you see here, we, uh, we use uh, exactly machine learning uh, to improve boundary parameter and improving that we can improve conversion optimization method. Uh, regarding the optimization, option selection it is similar, like improving boundary parameter, but in this case we use machine learning to select better optimization options, for example, like initial value, and it will uh, impact uh, convergence features and speed of convergence. And it is the same, um, the same approach. We use machine learning to improve optimization options, and in this way we also can improve uh, conventional optimization methods. Uh, regarding the surrogate model, it is uh, completely different uh, of previous uh, two approach. Uh, in this approach, uh, we use machine learning to completely replace optimization model, models. And uh, uh, this mod uh, surrogate model, it is very powerful, uh, powerful when we have uh, analytical models uh, which are un unavailable or it is uh, so com uh, computationally expensive. And generally, it is used in the dynamical models, uh, for example, uh, for dynamical controller, for demand response, and uh, those things. And generally, in, uh, in, um, in the research, they try to use reinforcement learning, but also uh, recently, it is also, there they are many research that, where they use uh, model, predictive conf, model predictive control, and uh, they try to implement, for example, some machine learning uh, technique or deep learning in model predict control. And uh, the last is the hybrid model. Uh, what mean a hybrid model? It means that we combine the machine learning and opt optimization, I mean conventional op optimization, uh, to get uh, the overall performance. In this case, we have two structure, iterative structure and couple structure. Iterative structure is more uh, used in uh, dynamical model. For example, we have in this structure we have uh, 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 iterative uh, repeating of uh, optimization and machine learning step. But uh, for me, uh, it is much more interesting couple structure because uh, I'm working some research. I'm conducting some research in this field. Uh, couple structure it means how we can uh, how we can uh, embed machine learning. Uh, uh, in the optimization. Uh, it means how we can uh, replace some uh, in, uh, inefficient uh, optimi optimization parts, for example, some cost function, but mainly we try to replace some uh, constraints, in, uh, in inefficient constraints. And uh, now let's say to see how we can use that for stochastic optimization. And I will uh, uh, point you example how coupled structure can be done. Uh, regarding stochastic optimization, we know that uh, tra traditional grids are certain or with, uh, uh, with small uncertainty scale, uh, where um, conventional um, algorithms um, uh, can handle uncertainty very well. But in the modern power grid, um, uh, we have high penetration of new facilities, for example, uh, PV and wind, uh, uh, generators, electrical vehicles, storages, and so on, and all of them increase uncertainty in the system. Uh, by the side of us, like consumer, it is excellent. We have cheaper electricity and, for example, reduce pollution. But by side of power system uh, operators and uh, operation planning in general, uh, uh, we have uh, a number of new challenges. And for example, for us are interesting uh, technical uncertainty parameters like load forecasting error, uh, PV and wind power generation, and let's say charging and discharge for electrical vehicle. 
And if you see this equation, uh, it is well known uh, AC, optimal power flow equation, where we uh, try to find optimal dispatch, uh, uh, where we have some cost function and we have some constraints. Uh, in deterministic uh, traditional power grid, uh, it is work very well exactly. Sometimes we have to use some uh, approximation techniques and linearization or some um, um, uh, how to say that um, some relaxation to relax to because uh, it can be non-convex and some diff sometimes difficult uh, to do that but uh, regarding to stochastic when we have a modern system uncertain system uh, this equation uh, it will fail because our system can be uh, unsecure and because of that we can to consider we need to consider exactly stochastic optimization uh, stochastic optimization, uh, it's mean that uh, we will uh, improve security, but on the other hand, we can uh, we can uh, decrease uh, cost. Exactly, uh, our system can be uh, more expensive. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, stochastic optimization we can do with uh, conventional optimization, but it is, uh, uh, I want to show how it is also can be done with uh, machine learning. Exactly, if you see, we can uh, all constraints, uh, we can change with machine learning, where uh, if you see uh, inequality constraints will be changed uh, with, uh, it is probabilistic constraints. And uh, on this way, uh, we can, uh, and using machine learning, we can use different machine learning techniques. But uh, for example, for nonlinear OPF, we propose to use some nonlinear algorithms, for example, like GP or others, let's say also random forest and so on, maybe some deep learning techniques. And uh, on this way, uh, we can, uh, we exactly uh, can uh, to catch, uh, to handle uh, uncertainty which we have in input, we can also to handle in the output and our system will be more secure. Uh, also, I would like to mention uh, some real application of machine learning in power industry, which um, our team uh, have done. Uh, we collaborate for no, uh, until now, we collaborate with two companies, with Tequal uh, Park Company and Global Insulator Group. Uh, Tackle Park Company uh, dealing with uh, digital power station, while Global Insulator Group dealing with uh, producing and monitoring uh, uh, insulator for power systems. Uh, in Tackle Company, we develop algorithm of clustering events in real time uh, to monitor and uh, prevent uh, possible failures. And for example, in this case, we have some unsupervised uh, unsupervised problem where we use for some, some clustering technique. But in the um, uh, global insulator, we also develop algorithm of determining the level of the pollution, I mean pollution of insulator, and to predict the percentage of discharge vol voltage. Uh, for example, in this case, we have some supervised problem and we use uh, uh, some uh, regression and classification techniques. Uh, and here I wanted to show you that uh, in some kind of power system industry, uh, we nowadays we can uh, implement uh, some uh, machine learning techniques. Exactly, we can create uh, artificial intelligence application for power industry. And in the end, uh, uh, let's say some conclusion uh, that the application of artificial intelligence in the field of power systems is, is still in the research phase. But uh, as I uh, show you that uh, nowadays we can still find some, some part of power system industry where we can um, eff efficiently implement uh, uh, artificial intelligence application. And also it is by my, my attitude that uh, we can be optimistic uh, regarding to uh, using uh, artificial intelligence in the future uh, in the power system. And I think that artificial intelligence will completely or partially replace some processing power system industry. And uh, considering uh, from academia that uh, we have to make uh, more research in this uh, and to try to, to help exactly industry to uh, move to AI. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's all, if you have a question. You also thank you, Emilio. 
Thank you. Thanks a lot for, for your very informative presentation. Um, let's wait for a couple of minutes. Probably the questions will arrive in the chat of the event. Mm -hmm. um, well, while, while we are waiting, waiting, probably I could ask you a question. And the question is, um, so there is, um, how to say, naive opportunity uh, to take some machine learning uh, tool from the shelf and apply it straightforwardly to the to, to the specific applications. Um, mm -hmm. What are the um, what are the consequences of such a decision, and what are the difficulties? What are the challenges when uh, starting implement um, machine learning tools uh, into real applications based on your experience? Uh, uh, based on my experience, uh, okay. first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Somebody. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, from my experience, exactly the, w one of the uh, most problem is uh, lack of data, because uh, for example, now we want to do some research, we don't have a real world uh, data, and we we have to make some simulation to to make. Uh, all research on synthetic data. I think it is the the most problem in uh, research, and also I think that uh, most of companies uh, uh, are not uh, how to say people uh, are uh, they don't believe in this still, and I think that uh, for example, uh, if you want to uh, deal with some company that uh, they will give as data but uh, they want to to be publicly uh, we have to how to say not to talk about that and also it is one problem and i think that uh, the first problem is uh, lack of data but also uh, regarding to other concepts uh, i think also that uh, we have to work on that uh, uh, on robustness of our model i mean uh, if we will learn, for example, model on some data, but what what happen if we have missing data, or we have some data which uh, our model is not learning that, and I think that uh, it is crucial problem also uh, to implement in, in power industry because in power industry uh, we can't uh, have some mistake, for example, okay in. Uh, Let's say in some or in, in other uh, in other topics we can some okay if something for example robot in in home if something do not good okay it's not nothing happen but some mistake in in uh, in uh, for example power system uh, can uh, make many uh, a big loss for example financial loss or or some other loss and I think that is this is uh, the main problems of machine learning. Yeah, thank you for your answer. So we have a couple of questions from the chat. So mm -hmm. I will just read both of them and then you decide how to answer. So first question is, uh, uh, can you please elaborate how machine learning will be applied for optimization problem? And the second one, is, the second question is, is there any platform uh, or web page where uh, power system data is available, or how to how to collect data we are talking about power systems. Exactly. Okay. Uh, let's the second question. Firstly, uh, we have uh, exactly uh, how you can uh, get data. Firstly, you can simulate data using some simulation tools. If you, for example, for power systems. Uh, also, I don't know. Maybe on website you can try, but I try to find some data and it is uh, very difficult. For example, data for a company, which we do, we collaborate for a company and company uh, provide us data. Uh, but I'm not sure, as I said, the big problem is to find uh, open source data uh, for power systems. Uh, maybe there is some site, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, what I did, I did uh, with synthetic data or I collaborated directly with company and company provide me data. It is the second question. Uh, the first question, uh, uh, how I can elaborate 
to elaborate how I can use uh, machine learning for optimization. Uh, exactly, uh, I don't understand quite because uh, here uh, there is uh, like four concept of using machine learning. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, you want, what is your point of question, but uh, uh, for example, if we consider couple structure, uh, what does mean? Uh, we will uh, use machine learning. I mean, for example, let's say supervised learning. We have some data. We will learn function from those data and those machine learning function, which is learned from data, we uh, embed to optimization. Exactly, we will change uh, uh, power flow equation, for example, Newton equation. We will change that with machine learning equation, which is learned from data. Or for example, in some, uh, let's say that we have some demand response or some things, control things, which it is difficult to get uh, uh, first principle model. Uh, we also use machine learning to, from data learn function. And those function we use like uh, the model in incorporate the optimization. I'm not sure uh, if I answered question, but maybe maybe some feedback can I receive? Well, I think it's, it's partially yeah, you, you did answer, so that's fine. Um, um, so yeah, thank you, Milen. Thank you for sharing with us your presentation and ideas about how to apply machine learning for our system optimization. And uh, now it's time to give a floor to the next speaker of today. Um, this is Dr. Raju Paide from uh, Upper Hour Solar Energy uh, Solar Technology. Uh, so welcome. And uh, looking forward to hear your presentation. So can you see my screen now? Yeah, it's here. Uh, well, so, so I'm going to present on the topic like uh, we have implemented uh, one uh, ANN based uh, tool for forecasting power system inertia with uh, wind farms penetration. So this was uh, part of the migrate project uh, in the University of Manchester when I was working with uh, Professor Vladimir. So I'm going to present on the uh, the main uh, topics is like uh, how we can uh, develop this uh, tool and uh, how we can validate uh, this tool at the academic level or in the practical power system network. And I will uh, I will explain uh, how we can utilize the tool. Like uh, we have taken one simple power system network like IEEE nine bus system and how we can implement uh, this development and uh, validation procedure uh, for that uh, particular IEEE nine bus system. And I will give the how. Uh, we can implement for the practical power system network. So, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm going to present on the uh, development and validation procedures for the artificial neural network based tools for inertia forecasting. So, development stage mainly involves uh, two things. One is uh, uh, correlation analysis. So, before uh, uh, before implementing the before implementing or training the artificial neural network tool, so we need to finalize the uh, what are the we need to identify what are the best power system variables uh, that can be nominated as inputs. So for that, uh, we need to do the correlation analysis. Like uh, uh, we will capture the, all the power system variables like voltage, magnitudes, voltage angles, and uh, total active, reactive, active power generation, reactive power generation, total active, active load by the active power load, total reactive power load. So like uh, we will take the, all the power system variables and uh, we will identify the which are which uh, power system variables are more uh, correlated with the power system inertia estimation. So after finalizing the inputs, after finalizing the best inputs, after that we will have output as a inertia power system inertia. Then we will train the uh, inertia forecasting tool uh, with that uh, best nominated inputs and the inertia as an output. So this is in the development stage, in the validation stage, uh, what we will do is uh, we will take the same tool and uh, uh, this tool uh, we have developed in the MATLAB uh, MATLAB uh, software and uh, for for validating this tool what we have done is uh, we have taken uh, we will we have to take the same power system network uh, 
for which we have done the training and we will implement uh, that uh, power system network by using the uh, real time uh, software like rtds software and from that uh, we will get the samples as much as we can like if you got the more samples then your training will be more efficient and uh, you will have the more efficiency of the tool so likewise uh, we will acquire the more number of the samples from the real time simulations in the r scale so what we are doing is we are simply emulating the uh, real practical power system network and we are simply simulating with the rtds r scale software and from that uh, we are implementing the hardware loop simulation so why we are saying the hardware loop simulation is like uh, we have the end and tool uh, in the matlab tool and we have the power system actual power system network in the rs cut software and uh, we have to integrate we have to interface uh, uh, one system one pc uh, having the matlab software and another pc having the rs cut rtds software and uh, we have to acquire the data from the rtds and uh, we have to uh, we have to verify the how this tool is working so finally uh, i have given one example idp nanobus network how we can uh, implement how we can utilize this uh, development and validation procedure so you can uh, go through this uh, paper for the more details uh, uh, this we have published in uh, december 2020 so as you know that uh, i am mainly uh, mentioning about the power system synchronous inertia why we are mentioning the synchronous inertia like we have the different inertia types like uh, virtual inertia synthetic inertia but here we are mainly concentrating on the power system synchronous inertia or the rotational inertia so it is mainly resulted from the rotating masses of the synchronous generators or the induction motors which are directly uh, coupled to the uh, grid and which provides uh, these uh, machines uh, they are having the rotational part and they usually uh, store the energy kinetic energy and that will release the energy whenever there is a mismatch between the power supply and demand so as we know that it plays a important role in the rate of change of frequency as we know that rate of change of frequency is mainly related to the balance between the power supply and demand when there is a uh, when there is a imbalance between this power uh, generation and the demand we will have a more uh, rate of change of frequency so as we know that our coa of like uh, rate of change of frequency when we see the power system production settings when we see the power system control settings the so most of the things are uh, most of the things are uh, depending on the our engineering society <laughs> hello yeah okay so this is how we can uh, uh, what is the importance of the power system synchronous inertia so if you see the power system inertia definition what we are doing is uh, we are mainly uh, taking the ratio of the kinetic energy stored in the system to the rate of apparent power so as you can see we are mainly taking the uh, the parameter inertia constant j parameter from that uh, we are finding the uh, what is the kinetic energy stored in the system and after that we are taking the ratio to the uh, rate of apparent power so when i am going to the integration of the wind forms so we are mainly concentrating on the integration of the wind forms and uh, when we integrate the more wind forms Uh, these are not directly coupled to the uh, power system grid and these are coupled to the electronic interface so until unless uh, you are using some special control like uh, virtual inertia control or synthetic inertia control so these are not going to contribute any inertia to the power system network so in that case uh, when we go for the more integration of these wind forms so as you can see uh, what is usually happening is Uh, the power uh, rated power is going to be increased however the kinetic energy stored in the system is going to be decreased uh, here you can see uh, these are the different types of the uh, wind turbines wind generators like we have the type 1 type 2 these are the directly coupled and those will uh, uh, contribute the inertia to the power system network however uh, these are not uh, recommended uh, for the real power system network so when we go for the type 3 and type 4 these are these two these two are recommended uh, uh, for the practical power system network however uh, these two are mainly power electronic based one when we are going for the power electronic based one uh, those are not at all going to contribute any inertia to the power system network so where, as you can see uh, the what is happening is the power rated uh, power is going to be increased however there is no any inertia contribution from the wind forms 
so due to that uh, the total system inertia is going to be reduced so likewise uh, if i am replacing uh, all the synchronous generators with the wind farms uh, the complete inertia is going to be reduced and uh, that will affect the rate of change of frequency and that will affect the uh, entire power system control settings production settings so in that case uh, what we need to do is uh, we have to go for the modification of the grid code for the more renewable integration so the main motivation why we are going for the ai applications as you can see uh, we have utilized uh, artificial intelligence in the many applications like uh, power system planning application power system operation actions power system control applications like uh, previous uh, presenters have already given what are the different applications uh, we have covered some of the applications so this is the main development procedure so what we are doing is initially we are starting with the offline simulation Uh, so we are mainly modeling the any standard power system network or the real power system network in the uh, any power system analysis software. It can be Dixon and Power Factory. It can be MATLAB Simly. It can be any other uh, offline software or the real time software. So what we are doing is we are simply uh, performing the power flow simulations and we are obtaining the, all the power system variables like uh, voltage magnitudes, voltage angles, active power flows, reactive power flows. and what is the active uh, what is the active power by the load reactive power by the load so likewise uh, we are acquiring all the power system variables so we are mainly concentrating on the uh, the power system variables that can be measured by the phasor measurement units so nowadays so we are moving towards the wide area measurement system and uh, we would like to mainly utilize the measurements from the phasor measurement units and we would like to monitor the power system inertia from those measurements so that was the reason we are mainly taking the power system variables that can be measured by the phasor measurement units so after uh, after uh, acquiring the, all the power system variables so what we are doing is uh, we are mainly identifying identifying the uh, which are the best uh, power system variables that can be nominated as a inputs of the uh, artificial neural network so after finalizing the what are the best inputs and output as a power system inertia and uh, we are taking the training of the artificial neural network so by using the matlab software and we are mainly simply taking the simply uh, most used algorithm like uh, lm dap regression algorithm and you can also go for the any algorithm uh, it is just for uh, whatever we have done in our work however you can go for the any other algorithm some advanced algorithms so as i mentioned uh, uh, we we also need to do the correlation analysis uh, so from this correlation analysis so we can find the what are the best power system variables so what we are doing is in this correlation analysis so we are mainly utilizing the uh, one coefficient constant that is called as a pcc pcl correlation coefficient so that is mainly uh, it is mainly measures the linear correlation between the any two sets of the variable so if you got the pcc constant more than the uh, 0.9 more than the 90 percentage so that means uh, we have the uh, more, more co linear correlation between those two variables and uh, we can go for the selection of those power system variables so likewise we have done the correlation analysis and we have identified the what are the power system best power system uh, variables uh, which which can be considered inputs for the artificial neural networks so we have mainly uh, taken the uh, the most basic uh, type of the ann like uh, the most common type of ann like uh, feed forward neural network uh, multi uh, layer mlp feed forward neural network as i mentioned uh, have mainly taken we have mainly taken the lm dap regression algorithm so this is how it looks like like uh, when we go for the mlp uh, ffn and uh, for this uh, as you can see we have the inputs we have the outputs and in between we have the ideal layer so in that ideal layer uh, in that ideal layer we need to uh, we need to find how many number of the neurons so we have to take in that ideal layer so for that we need to go for the optimization of the number of the uh, neurons in the hidden layer so for that what we have taken is uh, we have taken uh, we have considered some statistical indicators like uh, mean absolute percentage error mean square error root mean square error so observing these values uh, we have taken like uh, we have done the trial and error method like uh, we have started with one number of uh, uh, neurons in the hidden layer and up to 100 number of the neurons in the hidden layer so likewise uh, we have calculated the these three statistical indicators then uh, 
we have seen that uh, we found that for each number of the neurons in the hidden layer we got the uh, lesser number of the these three statistical indicators so we have finalized that number in the number of the neurons in the hidden layer so this is the validation procedure so as we mentioned uh, whatever the power system network whatever the uh, real power system network we have considered in the development and training stage uh, we will consider the same network in the rtds and we will acquire the real time and uh, timeline output data streams from the pmus uh, through the open pdc uh, this is like uh, for that uh, what we are doing is as you know that as i mentioned that uh, we are mainly considering the uh, two tools like one is a matlab tool another one is a rscar rtds so in between uh, we have embraced one interface interfacing tool that is called as a sadf tool uh, like uh, synchronous uh, measurement uh, data interface tool so uh, after that what we are doing is uh, we have taken the we have captured the all the power system variables measured by the feather measurement units from the rscar software and after that we have done the post processing uh, to acquire the useful data from that uh, large amount of the data and uh, that data can be feeding to the artificial neural network in the matlab what we have developed in the matlab so from that uh, we can take the validation of the an and based inertia forecasting tool so by using some error analysis so this is uh, how the setup looks like uh, we have the rtds r square so in which uh, we are implementing the real real power system network uh, like whatever the any itp standard power system network or any real power system network uh, we have the another pc which is having the open pdc and matlab and we have the another, another pc like uh, uh, we have the rscar runtime so on which you can monitor the whatever the we are modeling inside the this rtds rscar and uh, hardware so as you can see all these uh, all these things are interfacing through the ethernet and we have the one standard like itpdc 37.118 and we have the standard for the ethernet boost for interfacing the gt net of this uh, rs rds so this is why i called as a hardware in loop like uh, we have the different uh, hardware and uh, we are interfacing through the ethernet so this is uh, how it looks like conceptual view what we are doing is uh, we are capturing the phasor measurement from the pmus and we are transferring to the microsoft SP sql server to the open pdc like uh, any hardware pdc or the open pdc software and from that uh, we are transferring all the uh, captured measurements to the matlab by using this sadf tool sadf stands for synchro measurement application development tool it is uh, developed by the dtu denmark so that tool we have utilized and uh, we have captured all the measurements from the rscar and we have uh, captured the data we have feeding the data into the matlab software and uh, we are feeding the data to the whatever the artificial neural network tool developed in that uh, matlab software so these are the uh, what are the power system variables we are considering like uh, from the correlation analysis uh, we can find the what are the best power system variables and uh, we can uh, do the post processing so for the uh, for the error analysis uh, here we have taken the absolute percentage estimation error like uh, we have taken the uh, difference between the predicted value and actual value with respect to the actual value so from this we can see that what is the error between the predicted value using the artificial neural network tool and what is the actual value of the inertia so these things i will show in the results and discussion section so coming to this uh, we have taken one simple itrly nimbus nimbus test system uh, as we know that this is also called as a uh, western system coordinating council like uh, wscc nine bus uh, test system or the pm anderson nine bus model it is mainly having the three synchronous machines with itrly type 1 exciters we are having the three two winding power transformer six transmission lines three loads so as you can see we mainly have the three synchronous generators that is a z1 z2 z3 so what we are doing is uh, we are replacing uh, this synchronous generator with wind forms uh, one by one after that uh, two synchronous generators at same time so likewise so we are keeping one synchronous generator and remaining two replacing with the one or two replacing with the wind forms so for that we have taken the different scenarios so what we have done is for scenario one scenario two it is for the replacing any one of the synchronous generators like z2 z3 with the wind form so scenario three is for uh, replacing the z2 and z3 
simultaneously when we are replacing the C2 and C3 simultaneously at the same same time, shield G1 is a synchronous generator. So in the scenario four, what we are taking is uh, for initially uh, we have replaced G2 with the wind form. After that, replacing complete replacement of the G2 with the wind form. So we are replacing G3 with the uh, G3 with the uh, wind forms. So likewise, we have taken the four numbers of the scenarios. So this is only for the hydrogen nine bus system since we have only three generators and uh, we are mainly experimenting on the replacing one of the generators, replacing replacing any two of the generators simultaneously or one by one. So if you are considering the real practical power system network, if you are considering the another any large power system network, so these scenarios are going to change. So what we have done is uh, after that we also done uh, considering the demand side inertia and uh, including the demand side inertia. So demand side means uh, from the load side. So induction motor is directly coupled to the power system grid and it will also having the rotational power and that will also contribute the uh, inertia to the power system network. So in one case uh, we haven't considered the inertia contributed from the induction motor loads. In the another case uh, we have considered the inertia contributed from the uh, induction motor so load loads. So likewise you can see you can observe in the results section uh, in the results and discussion uh, section. In that C, you can see the difference between the uh, case one and case two when we are excluding the demand side inertia, when we are including the demand side inertia. So, as I mentioned, uh, we have done the uh, correlation analysis by using the PCC for finding the better power system variables. So, I will give the what are the observations uh, after this doing this uh, complete analysis. So, from this, uh, what we observed is like uh, uh, the main uh, observed that we have observed that. A total active power generation from the all the synchronous generators, total active power produced by the uh, wind forms or the power electronic interface generators and total dynamic load, dynamic conditional motor load in the system. So these three variables having the uh, larger uh, PCC values. So uh, we are nominating uh, these three as a bust power system variables for the, for the for forecasting the for forecasting the power system inertia artificial neural network tool. So in case of uh, if you don't have the information on the uh, total dynamic load in the induction motor, in that case uh, we can go with the considering the only two variables like uh, active power generation from the synchronous generators and active power generation from the wind forms. So likewise uh, we have taken the two best power system variables in case of the unavailability of the induction motor load information or three best power system variables when you have the availability of the induction motor load. So after acquiring this complete data uh, for training of the data, what we are doing is we are taking the splitting of the data. So like uh, uh, we can go for the 70 percent is for the training, 15 percent is for the validation, 15 percent is for the test provides. Uh, we can go for the any any splitting of the data. Likewise, you can go for the 60 percent is for the training, 20 percent is for the validation, 20 percent is for the testing. So likewise, you can go for the any samples like you can go for the 80 percent is for the training. 10, 10 for the validation testing. So we have done the different cases. Uh, at the end, uh, what we got is uh, when we go for the splitting of the data with 70 percent is, 15 percent is, 15 percent is, we got the regression value close to the 99.98 percent is. So we have gone for that uh, uh, this uh, splitting of the data, particularly for the I T nine bus system. So this is how we have find the optimal number of the neurons uh, for the case one and case two. So as you can see for the case one, we got the uh, 12 number of the neurons are the better optimization neurons and uh, for the case two, we got the 83 number is the better optimal, optimal neural, neural neurons in the hidden layer. So this is how it looks like for the case one and case two. As you can see for the case one without induction motor load information, we have the two inputs and we have the 12 number of the neurons in the hidden layer and we have the one output that is uh, power system inertia. For the case two, we have the three inputs like uh, active power generation from the synchronous generators, active power from the uh, wind forms and the total induction motor load and we have the 83 neurons in the hidden layer from our optimization problem and we have the one output layer and we have the one output that is the power system inertia. So this is how we have done the training for the ITP 9 bus system. So likewise, we have also done the validation. So if you see the results uh, here, you can see the first thing uh, you can observe the difference between the case one and case two. So in the case one and case two, if you see that uh, there is a difference between the power system inertia values. So since we are considering the inertia contribution from the 
induction motor loads in the case to uh, we have the larger inertia values for all the uh, for all the scenarios and one more thing uh, you can see that when we go for the uh, wind forms uh, wind forms replacement with the z2 or z3 the power system inertia is going to be reduced from the zero percentage to 100 percentage so likewise you can observe the uh, this one and you can if you see that uh, uh, the ape value like absolute percentage error if you see the case if you see the difference between the case one and case two uh, case two is providing the lesser error as compared to the case one since we have taken the uh, more number of the data and uh, more number of the power system variables so that was the reason why we got the uh, lesser number of the less um, less value of the error as compared to the case one in similar cases you can also see the uh, scenario 3 and scenario 4 so as you can see if you see that uh, scenario 1 and 2 scenario 3 in the scenario 3 case uh, the power system inertia is going to be reduced a lot since uh, uh, we are replacing z2 z3 simultaneously and then similarly in uh, scenario 4 also so initially uh, the inertia is the a uh, value with only g3 replacement and after that uh, complete replacement of g2 g3 you can see that we got the lesser inertia so in this case also hello so in this case also we got the case 2 is a better case and we got the lesser errors so that is a uh, uh, how we can uh, uh, utilize the tool so those are the results and uh, discussions and for the four number of the scenarios and two number of the cases so coming to the conclusions, uh, uh, we are mainly uh, we are mainly concentrating on the monitoring on the power system inertia. So power system inertia mainly uh, needed for monitoring the rate of change of frequency. As you know that rate of change of frequency plays an important role in the frequency load shedding as well as the constraint based on the R of like we have the frequency containment, we have the many other aspects like grid stability. So likewise, if you monitor the power system inertia efficiently, uh, you can monitor the rate of change of frequency efficiently and also uh, you can uh, you can take the control actions uh, efficiently and you can take the production settings efficiently and uh, you can also uh, optimize the operation of the entire power system and you can maintain the reliable operation of the power system network. So that is about my presentation. So due to the uh, time constraint, uh, uh, I have presented uh, fastly bit. So thank you for all your attention. Any queries, so we can discuss on the queries. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Raju, uh, for a wonderful uh, presentation on development and validation of ANN-based tools for forecasting power system inertia with wind power penetration. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for yeah. giving the opportunity. Yeah. And uh, I'm happy that uh, Professor uh, Valdimir has joined with us and I would like to invite uh, him uh, to say a few words to our audience. So firstly, let me double check if you can hear me. Yes, yes, surely. Excellent. So thanks to organizer, thanks to all attendees and uh, respected speakers. My apologies, uh, I had my private emergency. Um, I have extra one stone in my kidney, so I had, I had to be in hospital, so I'm uh, calling from my room. Anyway, uh, I would like to point out the following. Uh, when it comes to application of machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, uh, approaches, uh, it's very important to understand the physical process which uh, we are observing. It can be the whole electrical power system. We can go beyond to multi-energy systems. We can drop to distribution networks or go to microgrids or even just go to a single household. So understanding of uh, physical process, in other words, understanding of the model necessary for this understanding is crucial. Uh, the next step is appropriate application of uh, one of uh, methods which have been discussed earlier today and it is i can understand a challenge to decide which one to use traditionally students go to literature they see what has been presented already i might recommend that you go to other disciplines and see how in other disciplines similar problems have been solved 
And uh, for example, estimation of uh, power system inertia or fault level, they're critically important information without which modern and future systems with the uh, low inertia systems with high penetration of converter interface generation cannot uh, operate uh, in a secure and reliable way. That's why we have situations when conventional approaches are not appropriate and when we have to apply something what is coming from artificial intelligence and machine learning, deep learning. So, for example, um, jointly with Raju, we have finished this work uh, as a result of huge massive European Union um, uh, sponsored uh, project uh, called Migrate and we had difficulties in estimating uh, or discovering, calculating uh, fault level, which is important for voltage stability of power systems. And we are right now <clears throat> jointly with Mile working on this topic. We have also one strong support. Here is Ilya, and we feel much more confident that uh, we'll move forward. Beyond that, all of you are very welcome to join us to work on different types of topics. So thank you very much indeed, and I'd like to return the microphone to Sujil, who is the organizer. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor, uh, for your motivating words and guidance uh, for all. And uh, at last, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Elena for uh, nicely uh, coordinating the whole uh, session and uh, Ilya for giving a very wonderful uh, uh, insight on uh, fundamentals of AI and also the load monitoring and uh, Professor Valdemir for a very interesting session on AI applications in power system and multi energy system and various projects also. I would also like to thank Dr. Raju for giving his uh, session which is very wonderful on ANN based uh, tool for forecasting its uh, development and validation. So thank you very much uh, Al, and uh, thank you for accepting uh, our invitation and uh, preparing for us and uh, delivering sessions uh, for all of us and I'm sure that it will be a great uh, help and uh, a great learning experience uh, for, the, for all the uh, attendees and uh, organizers and all the participants. Thank you. If I can add to express thanks to Mile as well and to ask on behalf of uh, attendees, uh, mm. will this presentation be live and available over YouTube? Yes, yes, uh, we will make it live in uh, YouTube. Excellent. So this will be something very welcomed from the audience. Uh, so on my behalf, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, it looks that we are now in a position to close the session and to express thanks to organizers and to all, all of you attending the session. Goodbye and have a good afternoon, day, morning. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you so much uh, for your presence, uh, Professor Valdimar, sir. On behalf of uh, Electrical Engineering Department, RIT, and uh, IEEE Bombay section, uh, educational activity section, sir. We are very much thankful you have provided a very nice team with uh, with your emergency condition. Also, you have given uh, this support. We are so much thankful, sir, on behalf of all or this organizing committee and all participants. Thank you so much, sir. My pleasure. Thanks to you as well, sir. Uh, one uh, request: if uh, everyone is uh, just putting on the camera, we can have a uh, one good uh, snaps together. So camera is disabled for the participants. Yeah, yeah it is allowed, sir. Yeah. One more thing, sir. I think. Uh, oh, now it's so nice. Yes, yes. Such a pleasure yeah. to see all attendees. One more thing, sir. Attendance sheet is not available. Yeah, that yes, is. Yes, yes, it will be provided, sir. Please. Yes, we will be sharing that. Hello. Sujil, have you taken the snap, please?
Yes, one minute. Yes. 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 Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes. Sir. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, we will share the attendance link, uh, Sujil. Yeah, yeah, I'll be doing that. I'll be sharing that in a uh, group. Okay, so we'll share everyone... uh, all participants, please uh, bear with us. We'll share quickly on the WhatsApp group. You can fill it. So we can close here now. Thank you all. Sorry, yes.